Uh, thank you, Justin. Good morning, everyone. Trust you're happy to be here. We're excited to be here this morning. And uh, look forward to the time of uh, opening God's Word, as is our habit here this morning. And uh, so if you have your Bible or an app, I invite you to find your way to Philippians chapter 4. Um, for those who may be visiting with us, uh, generally here at Convergence, we select a, a book of Scripture and then spend uh, weeks, months uh, working through that verse by verse. And so that's where we're going to be today. Before we get into Philippians 4, uh, I want to tell you about a crazy thing we, uh, my daughter and I came across this past week. Has anyone here heard of a uh, YouTuber called James Jean? Anybody ever heard of James Jean? A couple of you have. Yeah, this guy's amazing, right? He's like modern-day Robin Hood. He's got shooting with a long bow or a recurve bow, no nothing, and he does these amazing trick shots. He'll take and he'll throw a, um, a skeet target up in the air and then shoot it with a bow and arrow. Um, he will actually take, um, have someone shoot an arrow in the air past him, and he'll take an arrow and shoot it right in half as it's flying by. Um, he'll take, uh, he'll have like set up where this thing's like dripping water drops, and it'll shoot the drops of water through the thing. And then the most impressive one I've ever seen, he says it's his hardest trick, he'll take a ring, like a wedding ring, and he'll throw it up in the air, and there's a target on the other side. And he'll take that arrow and he'll shoot it, and the arrow will go through the ring and pin it to the target. No CGI, no nothing. I've seen this thing. I'm like, I was right, Alexa. We were like freaking out. How does he even do this? He shoot an aspirin out of the air, an aspirin tablet. And I'm like, how does he do this? Well, he tells us how. Because after every one of his trick shots, he'll do the shot, boom, and he'll turn around and say, "That's how you do it." He's a country boy from Georgia, and that's sort of his tagline. Shoot. That's how you do it. You know, he's got one where he'll like have like four arrows on the bow at once. And he'll have like these targets moving past him on a zip line. And he'll shoot, boom, all four at once. That's how you do it. That was pretty frustrating. I want to know how to do it. You can't just demonstrate and say, that's how you do it. I admit, though, sometimes we look at the teaching of Scripture, and it's sometimes that puzzling. Right? We, we see instructions. instructions. Right? But how do you do it? Well, that's how you do it. Anybody ever get frustrated with that a little bit? A little bit? So the Bible talks a lot about our minds. You know, one of the greatest commandments, love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. How? Well, that's how you do it. Right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 2 Corinthians, casting down every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, that's how you do it. Now, I'm being a little bit simplistic, but I've got good news for you today because today's passage gives us real practical help about how do we direct our minds to the things of the Lord. So this is going to be... A great passage for those who get frustrated by the broad strokes sometimes because the Bible here in Philippians chapter 4 gets really into the nitty-gritty. And I'm excited to share with you this morning. And uh, let's go ahead and look at today's passage. I've asked you to stand for respect to the Word of God as we read in Philippians chapter 4. Just two verses, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable... Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. We thank you for the direction that it provides to us, Father. And uh, for this passage today, we ask you to help open our minds, help us to understand, open our hearts that we may receive what we hear. And God, give us a desire to put into practice and to share with those around us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> So this verse gives us clear instruction. It tells us to think about these things. 
The idea here is directing our thoughts to these categories. And some people say, well, I can't really direct my thoughts. My mind just wanders. It does. That's a tendency that many of us have. But I want to show you we can direct our thoughts. So I want everyone to close your eyes just, just for a minute for me. And for the next 10 seconds, I'll give you an assignment. I want no one here to think or vision or picture a blue elephant. Okay? Not navy blue. Not baby blue. Okay? Not blue plaid. Not blue stripes. No blue. No baby elephant. No adult. No mama. No bull elephant. No Dumbo. No Mastodon. No nothing. All right. Open your eyes. How many of you were successful at not seeing or envisioning or thinking about a blue elephant? A couple of you who were asleep, maybe. Okay, well, good for you. Most of the room had trouble. Why? Because your thoughts were being directed by something outside, right? You had influences that were directing your thoughts. And even though it was saying, don't think about these things, obviously your mind goes there and thinks about these things. So we see here this list, a very practical list, of what things should we direct our minds toward. You know, when we have downtime and free time, we are volitional creatures. We have a will. We can choose how we're going to spend our time, where we are going to direct our thoughts and minds. And this gives us a list, a little checklist, six items. Okay, something that's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. Kind of an overarching category. If there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, these are the things we're to think about. So we're to avoid... Things that aren't true, errors, lies, falsehoods. We're not to spend our time on those. You know, some people get passionate about reaching cultish, you know, members in cults, Jehovah's Witness or something like that. Oh, I just got to learn all about them and then spend all their time reading these errors, <laughs> these twistings of Scripture. And more than once I've seen people who pour themselves into that, they can't get caught up in it. Because they direct their mind towards these errors. You know, if you want to reach people for Jesus, don't go down to where they are. You need to focus on the truth of God's Word so that when they come with something that doesn't line up, you have the standard to compare it with. Direct it towards truth. Honorable. This is the idea of nobility. The NIV says noble. Things that are high. Not things that are vulgar and low and mean, but things that are a higher goal. I think of like the nobility of um, feudal England. You know, you had the, the high prince and king and who were above everything in some ways. What was that? Well, that was what everybody aspired to, right? Because that was the ultimate, the best, the epitome. And what did they do? The good, I mean, obviously there were a lot of bad you know, rulers and kings in that era, but those who were noble rulers, those are the ones who would provide for and take care of and condescend to those around us, around them, and provide for their needs. Justice, those things that are just and right, not biased, but fair, not evil, but right. We need to avoid the biases that are present in our society. Racism, you know, that, oh, well, you know, I'm not really touched by that. Well, are you or not? Maybe you should learn something about it. Talk to somebody else and say, hey, take a look at me. Give, evaluate myself. You know, am I acting in a just manner? Do you see justice in my heart and in my actions? Pure. Things that are not corrupted. They're not sinful. I mean, I could spend a whole message on the pandemic of pornography in our country today. You know, that is not pure. That is corrupted. That is sinful. But... I doubt there are 1% of American males who haven't experienced or struggled or still struggle with that. And if that's your struggle today, then I encourage you, that's going to be tough to deal with on your own. Okay, you're going to need to get some help, confess your sins to others, and get some encouragement. That can be overcome. That is not okay. That is not something to say, well, it's just who I am. Natural. We need to direct our minds toward things that are pure. Lovely, you know, things that are beautiful, things that are, you know, lovely. It's just things that are, are good. I think about politics. 
That's kind of ugly, you know? And certainly as we live in a society in which there is a, we have a part in government, so we need to be somewhat aware. But if that's where you're directing your thoughts all day, every day, you know, watching the news channels, watching the talk shows and the podcasts, and you're just constantly embroiled in this political thing, it's not really lovely. We only have limited time in a day. And every hour that you pour yourself into those things is an hour that you can't put into something else. Sometimes those things aren't bad, but are they what we're challenged to here? Are these the things that are going to promote our growth in Christ? Are these the things that are going to line up with the command here, to think on these things that are excellent and praiseworthy? Commendable, the idea of something that's worth talking about, something that's not shameful. Boy, I tell you, we won't find much of that on social media, do we? Yet many of us spend a lot of time on social media. So as we talk about directing our thoughts, let's try to find those things that are in this list and avoid these things that I've talked about. I mean, this is just scratch the surface of examples. I don't have time to go into depth on all these. But hopefully as I put these out there, your mind has begun to think of, oh, yeah, well, this, that, and the other. I, these are things that I do struggle with. These are things that I, have watched that I need to watch out for. And I know that some people will say, well, Carl, that's all great. But the fact is, we live in a world in which all these things, just like when I closed my eyes and you started giving me all these things about blue elephants, I just couldn't get away from them, right? And sometimes we'll say, yeah, that's just the world we live in. We're inundated by all these things, by error and pride and you know, politics and conflict, and we're, we're just, I can't get away from it. So I think that this also gives us categories for us to utilize as we experience the world around us. I found it mildly interesting that Paul actually, when he wrote this, he wrote, whatever is, every time. Whatever is true. Whatever is honorable. Okay, now that's nothing for us. We're on a keyboard, typing, whatever. It takes that long. We're voice chatting. It takes no time. Whatever is. You know, Pen and paper wasn't easy to come by back then. He wasted all this paper. I, I was making a list, my notes, I just have whatever is, and then I have them all listed. But he took the time, not just put whatever is true, honorable, just, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. Now, I don't want to make too much a deal of this, but it did strike me that he took the time and the paper real estate to, to separate those. So what does that mean for us? Does it mean anything? I think it does. What? Don't know for sure, but to me it looks like, as I think about this idea of categories, that we should look at everything for the truth, and not just compartmentalize and say, oh, well, that's true, and oh, here's something that's just, and here's something that's honorable, and there's something that's pure, but as we look and experience the world around us, we should use these categories to process and find these things, almost like lenses. Y'all know I love movies. Anybody seen National Treasure 2? You know, Nicolas Cage and, you know, all this. Okay, I love that movie. For those who may not have, you know, he's going around exploring all these, you know, things from Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, the Founding Fathers, and all this stuff. There's one scene where he goes, and there's this map. And they can't really see much about it. But then they find out that there's these glasses that Ben Franklin made, you know, way years ago, that have multiple lenses, all crafted out of different things and different colors, and they're all in little arms that articulate when you put them all together, and you have all these lenses line up, and you look at this map, wow, suddenly you get this amazing picture, all right? And the secrets are revealed, basically. That's almost how I see this, that these are lenses for us to look at not just the lens of truth, but all these lenses of truth, honor, just, purity, loveliness, commend being commendable. All these lenses come together, and this should form our worldview. These are the things we should think about. These are categories that the world does not tend to use. These are categories that even ourselves and our own flesh will not tend towards. You know, a lot of times if we ask people, hey, how do you see things in the world? Where do you direct your thoughts? It's going to be, oh, well, I want to find something that's pragmatic, you know, real practical. If what works, we've got to figure out what works and work with it. Maybe something, ah, I'm find out what's comfortable. You know, I've got to go the, the most comfortable route possible, what's easiest for me. You know, my truth, your truth, not the truth, 
but my truth. You know, so we're going to take a category that's here and twist that even. What's popular, right? What will people like if I, you know, think on these things? What's popular? TikTok, right? Oh, let's see what's popular today. Right? Who knows what's going to be next week? Tic-tac-toe, probably not. Um, science, the scientific things. These are the, these are the categories that the world uses. Okay, but God gives us a different set of categories for us to utilize. What does this even look like? How do we do this? What am I saying? I'm saying that as we live the world in the world around us, as we have the experiences day in, day out, how should we think? How should we see those things? Jesus gives us a great example. If you're going to flip over to John chapter 8, I want to walk through this. And, and bring to really to light more of what I'm saying in a real tangible way. In John chapter 8, verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Verse 6, they, this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So here we see these men, religious men. They come, and is what they're saying true? Was this woman taken in adultery? I believe so. I mean, it could have been lying, but I believe it was true. Okay? So, hey, they're, they're checking the list, right? But was there justice in this? Was there justice? Were they just looking at the truth, the lens of truth? As far as I know, adultery takes two. Where was the man taken in adultery? This woman wasn't even by herself, you know what I'm saying? There was no justice. Okay? Was this, was their motives pure? Were they seeking justice? Were they seeking to a righteous judgment before God? No. They were seeking to trick Jesus. They were, their motives were deceptive. They, didn't, they threw out these other lenses, and they twisted the lens of truth, all right, and said, this is, this is true. What are you going to do? What does Jesus do? Jesus bent down, wrote with his finger on the ground, and as they continued to ask him, they kept, hey, come on, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Huh, huh, huh? What do you think? He stood up and he said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. He gives them truth. Pure truth. We're all sinners. You're right. She's probably sinned. She's guilty. But so have all of y'all. He stands up with a noble motive, an honorable motive, a revealing, not this woman's sin has already been revealed, but revealing the sin in their own hearts. Their response should have been, you're right, I repent, I confess, Jesus, forgive me. That wasn't their response, but that should have been. This is the lens Jesus has. So when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, who are, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, Sin no more. He acts in an honorable manner. He acts in a lovely manner. But look, there's not, it's just you. There's not even the, the man who you're accused of sinning with. He's not even here. There's no justice there. He acts in a commendable way. He spurs her on to righteous living. He extends love and grace and mercy as only Jesus could. These, this is an example of how we should live our lives looking at situations through these lenses. All right, quickly. Real life. You had a meal that wasn't your favorite. Okay, for whatever reason. Didn't like it, got burned, whatever. Yuck! I didn't, it was horrible. Well, it's true. You didn't like it. Maybe it was no good. But it's an ugly truth. Right? It's an ugly truth. You look at the, whoever cooked it, your wife, your mom. 
This is horrible. Is that the best you can do? There's no honor in that. There's no gratitude in that. This is the worst meal you've ever fixed. This is the worst thing I've had you eat all day. McDonald's would have been better than this. Keeping shame on this person instead of commending them. How do we look at the same situation through these lenses? Hey, thank you for loving us enough to plan and prepare a meal. We all know it didn't turn out the way you had anticipated, but thank you for, for loving us enough to do that. You know, you could have declined. You could have said, hey, you know, I, it, it's not going to happen today. But you didn't. We are blessed to have you in this family. I'm blessed to have you in my life. Same situation. But we direct our thoughts to the true things, the honorable things, lovely things. Okay? We can let our mind go either way, but we're called to direct these thoughts. This is how we should think. You have an argument with someone, a disagreement, you know, whether it's personal, whether it's, you know, national politics, whatever it is, you're wrong. Well, it may or may not be true, okay? Oh, you're an idiot. Well, that's not really lovely. Start name-calling people. Probably not going to get much results. You can't be a Christian and believe that. All right? That's uh, really crossing the line um, Really not justice to assume, to draw those conclusions. It's crossing over the line of what's just. I hate you, whether you say it or believe it. That's not pure. That's not from God. That is from the flesh. Instead, you look at people and say, I can agree with some of that. I can agree with some of what you're saying. Hey, thank you for sharing your perspective. You know, it's not easy to disagree with someone. You should recognize that and encourage that in the future. Let's pray for unity. How about that? Direct it to the one who gives unity. Let's pray for this. Hey, man, I love you. We may disagree, but I still love you. These are the lenses we need to use for our inter personal interactions. I've got some more examples. We don't have time. But these are the things that... We want us to, that we should be pursuing. This is how we should be directing our lives. And all these things, we're really seeing Jesus. You know, we're really just seeing Jesus and all these things. He's the truth. You know, he's the king of kings. There's no one more honorable, more noble than he. He is just and the justifier of those who believe in him through the gospel. He is the holy one of God, pure and sinless lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He is love. He is love. God is love. And he showed us how to live in a way that is the only commendable way. When we talk about this list, we're talking about Jesus. And then he kind of gives us a summary. Look, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything praiseworthy, these are the things you need to be thinking about. All right? You know, this is a short list, six items, but I'm going to try to help you remember this list. All right? I'm going to give you a statement that's going to help you remember this list. Do you remember this lens? I want to repeat after me. True hippos just purchase lovely cardigans. All right, repeat that with me. True hippos just purchase lovely cardigans. All right, so of course each letter is a mnemonic device. Even get three of the words in there. True, whatever's true. The H is honorable. The P is... I mean, the J is just, which is the word. The P is per, the, for pure, lovely, and the C is commendable. So if you remember that true hippos just purchased lovely cardigans, hopefully that will be a way for you to direct your mind easily. Remember the stupid visual image of a hippo wearing a cardigan. I don't even know what that would look like, but you can imagine. Okay? I actually, as I prepared this sermon a couple weeks ago, I actually wrote out these and stuck on the dashboard of my car. So that as I'm going along and thinking about things, listening to things, talking on the phone, driving along, I can see that. And that's how I should be seeing things. I don't need to see the odometer. I don't care how fast the engine's spinning. <laughs> I need to see what God wants me to direct my thoughts towards. All right? So I hope this has been helpful. We move on. That's how we should think. The next question, verse 9, deals with how should we act. How many times as adults do we tell our kids or do we need to tell our kids 
do as I say, not as I do. Right? Anybody ever said that or been in a situation where that was what your hope was? Do as I say, not as I do. Well, Paul had uh, quite a testimony because he put out there, do as you see me do. What you have learned, verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. So, quickly, what we have learned is what we put in our head. But Paul makes a distinction here between learning and receiving. Right? You can learn a, a fact, but then reject it from changing your life. And so Paul says both, what you learned and what you received. So let's receive this truth this morning. And what you've heard and seen in me. So here we see that we should find and follow godly examples. Right? Obviously the, the scripture is the standard, and no man is perfect, and all will fail. But there is a benefit to seeing a godly example and following in, his, in that person's footsteps, to learning from that and with that person. So we should strive to make those connections with godly examples. Obviously, Jesus is the ultimate one, and we should follow him and live as he did. <clears throat> we talked in the ministry yesterday about unity and the idea of if we're all doing the same thing and the reality of the kids game, follow the leader, Right? Early before the service, we had all the kids running around doing everything, all their own thing. You know, how do you get all the kids to do one thing together? Again, follow the leader. All right? Follow the guy in front. Just watch the guy in front and do what he does. And suddenly you have all these kids who are actually kind of doing the same thing. Miraculously, you've got to train them or teach them to say, just follow this guy. Do what he does. He raises his hand, you raise his hand. He jumps on one leg, you jump on one leg. He spent, you know, why? Because they're watching the guy in front. And that's how we need to live. Watch Jesus. What he does, we should do. That's how we should act. And as a flip side of this, we must be those godly examples. We're called to be a godly example. Why? Because whether you know it or not, if you're a parent, you definitely know it. But even if you're not, others will see what you're doing. Others will hear what you're saying, and they will be either led to draw closer to Jesus or they will be led astray. It's incumbent on us as the people of God to live out and be that godly example for all those around us. It's been said that your life may be the only gospel that anybody ever, some person ever reads. You may be the only Jesus, the only Christian that somebody else ever experiences. We have a duty and responsibility to pursue this godly lifestyle so that we can be that godly example for those around us. This is how we should act. As we have seen here, as Jesus acted, as the examples who we follow. And then finally, the last phrase, the God of peace will be with you. Now, in the ESV, it puts this as a comma and another clause. It's a little bit debatable. I've looked at numerous other translations. About half the translations make this a separate sentence. And the God of peace will be with you. And about half of them put it as a comma, as a connected thought to this. But what's definitely interesting is that there is no if you practice these things, then the God of peace will be with you. There is no if then. They are connected, but there is no conditionality. Paul is asserting, listen, what I'm telling you is going to help you, but it's going to be hard. Don't forget that God is with you. The God of peace is with you. Just earlier we saw him saying that the, if you do this, then the peace of God will be with you. And it's great to have the peace of God, you know, that God can give his peace. But what a blessed truth to have the God of peace with us. In a personal way, so much more personal than him giving us some item versus him being with us. You know, if you're here this morning and these things, these categories are new to you and you're, you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you that he wants to be with you. 
He's calling you today to be a follower of him. Some people have the idea that the, the Bible is just a bunch of rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. There's truth in Scripture. There is truth. The truth is that we, are all, we have all sinned before a holy God, that we are all guilty. That's the truth. But it doesn't stop there, right? Because the Bible goes on to tell us that God so loved this world. It reveals things that are lovely. He loved us so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, the highest, the most honorable, the most noble, condescended to come and take on human flesh, to live in this world, to live that perfect life, that pure life that we could not. And then he died and shed his blood, gave his life on that cross so that we don't have to suffer that penalty of death, so that we can live in him. We can have new life. We can become heirs, joint heirs with Christ and heirs of the Father. As I'm preaching these truths and communicating these things, if this is resonating with you and this is new for you, then see me afterward. We're going to have a time moment. You can come in the middle. We can talk. And I'd love to show you more of what this means for us to deny ourselves, for us to repent of our sins, to believe and trust in Jesus, to become a follower of him. If we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. If we draw close to him, he will draw close to us. But if we are followers of Jesus, it's not conditional on our performance. These are things we should do. This is how we should think. This is how we should act. But the truth is, and it's a blessed one, the God of peace will be with you. Don't forget that. Live in that light and encourage each other with these words. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we uh, come to you again just thankful for who you are, for what you have revealed to us and how you help us to live in this world that's oftentimes ugly and false and low and mean and vulgar and difficult. But God, may we trust in you. May we look to you. May we remember that through all these difficult things, you're with us. You're with us. What a blessed truth. We thank you. We praise your name. We're undeserving. And it's all of you, Jesus. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I'm doing the question. Sorry. So we're going to move into a time of discussion. Because, again, this is a, hopefully these are being great truths. But sometimes you'll hear something, and you'll go, and you kind of forget so what become our practice is we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to interact with each other. As you feel comfortable, form a group around you. And I want you to think about this question. Think back over the past week. I don't want you to go like years back. Past week or two, a few days. And I want you to remember a situation through these lenses in a different way than you experienced initially. I want you to think back, something at family, something at work, something on your personal level. Think of a situation that these lenses were not applied to in your initial response. And I want you to think back and discuss it and say, you know, this happened, and now I see I could find the truth here. I could find the beauty here. I could find the purity here. And I want you to discuss that. Let's encourage each other. Let's walk this out retro retrospectively, looking back. And hopefully in doing so there, it will help us to do so in the future as well. So, where can we see the truth, honor, justness, purity, loveliness, commendable aspect, excellence, or praiseworthiness of that situation? We'll just take about uh, five or eight minutes and uh, just form up where you are, and uh, let's talk about this for a few minutes. commendable aspect, excellence or praiseworthiness of that situation. We'll just take about uh, five or eight minutes 